and welcome to Current Accounts, the Heinrich Foundation's international trade podcast. I'm Stuart Patterson. Today, we're going to be talking about national security issues and their impact on the multilateral trading system. Um, And to do so, I'm joined by Nisha McDonough, who is a senior lecturer at Edith Cowan University in Perth. Prior to um, that, he was a lecturer uh, in international political economy at the Institute for International Trade at the University of Adelaide. Uh, Welcome, Nisha. Thanks, Stuart. Pleasure to be here. Now, it can't have escaped many people's notice that national security considerations uh, have always been pretty intertwined with trade. But in recent years, we seem to have seen quite a dramatic escalation in the number of national security related issues that have raised their head and their severity in terms of their impact on the free flow of goods and services around the world. Why do you think that is? So Stuart, to answer that question, I think we need to just bring in a little bit of international relations theory and particularly realism to understand what are the forces and tensions that kind of shape state behavior. And so power transition is a key key concept here. And this is well established in that literature. Basically, all it says is if, if there's a large change in relative power between large nation states, large countries, that often results in uh, spiraling effects of kind of tensions and potentially states fearing that th- their loss of power will lead to potentially new risks that they haven't seen before that. So if we were to just elaborate a bit more, all all that says basically is that in the international system, Stuart, nation states are the highest entity. So if another nation attacks you, you can't call the policeman. There's no global policeman, even if the U.S. occasionally played that role. There's nobody coming to help you. So it's anarchy. That's what anarchy means in an international relations context. Then there's uncertainty. You never know what a nation is going to do. History is replete with uh, nations getting into conflict over resources, over uh, positions, geopolitical positions, and so forth. So every government's core task is actually national security, to protect the state, protect its borders and its boundaries. Now, we often don't think about that in, in long periods of peace, but ultimately, that's a backdrop for all governments. And then uh, the last point would be nations are rational actors, right? So they're aware of risks and they respond accordingly. And also we note that every nation has a large military capacity, particularly big states. And so the reason they have those is because of future uncertainty. So what has happened in the recent few years is that these background tensions that were kind of put aside in the 2000s between the US and the new rising power, China, have actually come to a boiling point since 2016. And that's infected the whole system in a way. So China has gained a lot of power. It's developed economically. It's engaged a military buildup. It's put people on edge. It's claimed territory in the South China Seas. It's pushing nations around. And so countries are responding, including the US, which has large interests in that region. So this is heavily geopolitical in origin. No, that's very interesting. So obviously the global multilateral trading system, uh, as we sort of know it, came into uh, existence post-World War II uh, with the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, or GATT, as it was known. Uh, And that was the sort of predecessor organization for the World Trade Organization, which obviously came into existence much more recently in the mid-1990s. But when GATT came into force, the world was divided. You know, we had the Soviet bloc, and a large non-aligned movement. The members of that non-aligned movement were in fact members of GATT in in many cases. So it isn't a new thing that we've had a sort of some geopolitical tension and also at least an attempt to have a multilateral trading system. So is there something more than just the rise of China that is causing this tension? Is it perhaps more to do with the organisation of their economies, the different economic structures that is leading to the use of national security as, if you like, an excuse for protectionism rather than actually necessarily the cause of it? 
Yeah, look, that's really uh, brings in an important um, nuance to this whole contemporary era. So the, the metaphor of the Cold War is often used. And that's helpful in, in one sense, because it, just like the Cold War, this has a deep geopolitical undergirding these tensions and, and the kind of uprising of national security concerns. But as you mentioned, Stuart, during the Cold War, we had a first world, a second world and a third world. The third world was unaligned. The first and second world were basically the US and its European partners on one camp, the Soviet bloc in the other camp, and they were completely separated economically, almost completely. There was actually some energy flows going into Europe, gas and so forth, as it was later with, with Russia, the Russian Federation. But other than that, they were very unintegrated. They were separate, right? And they had different economic systems. What's different today is that when China joined the WTO as a communist socialist government, and a socialist market economy, which had pledged to liberalize over time and did liberalize quite a bit in, in some important ways. It never fully maintained, never liberalized in the ways that were hoped for. And this was actually a peace project, bringing it back to the geopolitics. The engagement strategy, which was the term used of bringing China into the WTO, was that integrate economically. That will drive liberalizations. Good. We get access to this market economic incentives. Brilliant. But also we will create so many interdependent linkages that there'll be no good reason to go to war. The cost will be too high. So this is economic peace theory. So it's quite ironic that today what's different with the Cold War is that the two countries with the biggest tensions and the most powerful nations in the system, the US and China, are heavily integrated economically, which create new security risks that just did not exist in the Cold War. So economic entanglement, rather than creating peace, is actually now creating tensions that are completely new. And there's a technological component to this. The technologies come on so much that uh, data flows, the way that um, technology can be used for national security purposes, for undermining others. For example, the Huawei example, if you've got a hidden code in your 5G so there's all these new risks, but the fundamental component is this economic entwinement that is really novel and new in creating these new tensions. So Nisha, the WTO, or GATT as it used to be called, do have provisions in their constitution, don't they? It's Article 21, I believe. And that provision is meant to facilitate national interests in the security domain and, and, and to sort of give countries the ability to look after their national security interests without breaching WTO uh, rules and regulations so that the multilateral trading system can sort of survive in, in an environment in which countries are looking after their, their security interests. But we've had two rulings, I think, recently, uh, one involving Ukraine and Russia about transit trade and one involving the United States with regards to its uh, aluminium and steel tariffs that were implemented using national security as the cause under the Trump administration. Now, how have those rulings from the WTO sort of altered the perception of the, the balance between national security and the uh, and free trade? Yeah, this is a really kind of dramatic transformation in the legal interpretation of that particular rule. Stuart, uh, Chad Bowen, a well-known observer from the Peterson Institution, called them the dreaded WTO rulings on national security. And there's a good reason for that, because there, there is a national security exception. It essentially says that in Article 21b, that nothing in this agreement shall be construed to prevent any contracting party taking any action which it considers necessary for the protection of its essential security interests. So that was put in in the 1947 GATT, and clearly nations wanted to have this ghetto clause, just in case economics and military capability are very much interconnected and we need to have this opportunity to pull out if we want. Now, obviously, from a trade liberalization perspective, you're going to say, oh, that's that's a very broad remit. Obviously, this can be used for protectionism. In actual fact, historically, it was treated very carefully by the members. So the members did want to liberalize. That's why they signed up. They did agree on the benefits of trade liberalization. So it was treated with great care. It was generally not litigated if it was used. And there was always an attempt to solve it uh, through discussion uh, rather than enforce rulings and, and prescribe rulings. So there was like 1961, Ghana used it to boycott uh, Portuguese goods when Portugal joined the WTO. 
And in it, it claimed that, look, this is an all-embracing uh, ghetto clause, and it also relates to future potential risks as well. Sweden famously used it to kind of block off uh, uh, imports of shoes, which was controversial. Members did raise that point in GATT meetings. Sweden eventually pulled back most of the measures, and it never got litigated. Uh, within the scholarly literature, there's no clear consensus. Some argue that there's, there are a couple of qualifying factors, and they qualify this all-embracing first components of 21b, 1 to 3 is a couple of qualifications. But other scholars say, no, they don't, that there's still that ability to define it as you will. So there was never a consensus on what the limits were. There was always a, a debate. Members themselves have at different points claimed, yes, you can say you can define it as you wish, or else the WTO can rule on it other times. So nobody knew what was going to happen. And then these rulings came along. Do you want to touch a little bit on the actual, on, the, on those two cases? I think what would be very interesting would be just to look momentarily, at least, at the, the legal arguments. Because as I understand it, what the United States has argued is that it, it's entirely up to the country concerned to judge whether or not uh, a, a particular issue is a threat to its national security. And so it's sort of self-justification. It's not even subject to scrutiny. And the United States don't even have to provide a rationale why they're pursuing this course of action. And, and am I right in thinking what the WTO have turned around and said, well, you do at least have to provide the justification. Is, is that how you interpret it? Yeah, so essentially the U.S. has maintained that this is its position for 70 years. Other countries also maintain that position. The qualifying terms actually after this all-embracing 21B uh, relate to fissionable materials, so nuclear weapons, right, uh, relating to traffic in arms. So for the cases we're going to discuss, it's not that. The other provision you have is taking in time of war or other emergency in international relations. Now, the, the key here is how do you define an emergency in international relations? If you're taking the future-orientated perspective, as militaries must, you could say, well, if we're in a conflict in, in eight years' time over Taiwan, we need to make sure we have our industrial capacity in place now and developing. So that would be uh, one way of defining it. So I think we can jump into the case law here because I can tell you how the WTO came down on this in the end in those two cases the measures concerning traffic and transit first. So that was the Russian case. The Ukraine took Russia uh, to, to task on this after Russia blocked transit through its country to third countries after it invaded the Donbass, actually, in 2016. So Russia did claim this is wholly self-judging. We agree with others. The United States uh, supported that position in that case, and Russia lost that, right? So the, the panel argued that while the member has the, the right to interpret risk and interpret what it, its essential security risks are, the requirement to apply the security exception in good faith means that it can actually be assessed by a panel. So they rejected that. Now, that has implications for the U.S. case that comes afterwards. Russia did win its other argument, which was basically that we did apply this legitimately because there's an emergency in international relations. We caused the emergency, right? They didn't say that because they, they invaded, but there was a genuine conflict between the two countries. So that was that case. So if we follow that on, then the U.S., then their case comes up with the uh, tariffs on steel and aluminium. And basically, in that case, the U.S. also argued that it was wholly self-judging. They lost on that. So the, now there, there's already a precedent in the system this first time. So they have to follow that. They follow that. They reject the U.S. position. Uh, and they also reject the claim from the U.S. that there's any other justification. And the U.S. wouldn't give a justification, Stuart. Actually, for quite some time, it just refused to even go to the point and say, this is an emergency in international relations or a time of war. It wasn't a time of war. Uh, but eventually they said, and this is all they said, they kept it ambiguous. You could say that in terms of the evidence at hand, this may most likely relate to an emergency in international relations. So the panel just rejected that. And so now we're in this position where the US response was withering. They just completely lashed the WTO panel, said this is completely out of, out of bounds. It's not your position to rule on this. We reject it wholeheartedly. Uh, immediately, that was the USTR response, United States Trade Representative. So it blows open the whole domain for now others to apply national security exceptions. So, so just to be clear, Nisha, would you say that these two rulings constitute 
a sort of revisionism of the original intention of the constitution? Or do you think that it's just that we've been able to go from the mid-1940s up till now without litigating to the point where the WTO have actually had to clarify what the constitution originally meant? Yeah, I, I think it's the latter, Stuart. I don't think it's any major revision. I think I think you can read this whole thing both ways. Legal scholars think that because they disagree on it. And historically, member states have applied it in both different ways. The European Union has, has said it both ways as the EEC, the European Economic Community, it said it was wholly self-judging. It's in the north of one of the gap meetings. And as the EU later said, no, there's restrictions on this. So even within the EU, they've institutionally changed their position. So I think, uh, and the WTO panel laid out its argument in very good detail. I think it was a good, a legitimate kind of uh, and convincing argument. But going back to the international relations perspective and, and how states behave, they're not going to allow an impingement of their national security of that type. And so that's, it's just not going to work for them to, to bow down to a legal interpretation because national security issues are too, too important. So that's why the WTO and GATT did not want to rule on this. People will not adhere to it, and that undermines the credibility of the system. So, so Nisha, in the Article 21 that you, you read some snippets from there, you were talking about uh, armaments and what have you, but clearly the domains of national conflict have broadened in recent years. The media, for example, has become a very important uh, mode by which countries try and influence each other. So is the Article 21 definition of, uh, of the sort of materials and, and, and national security out of date? And is it the case that just almost anything to do with the economy can now be potentially weaponized in a way that means there's a national security implication? That's actually quite an interesting um, observation to think through that maybe there are some qualifying factors and are, are they out of date? And I think, sure, this goes back to the initial struggle of countries. We have to have a carve out for national security, but we don't want it to be that you can just run with this any way you want. So it's, it's self-judging, but there's some kind of qualifications and we're not sure how they match up. And I think that's why the U.S. has stood with this position kind of soon after, very quickly after that consensus was made. And it is ambiguous, right? And a lot of international agreements have ambiguity in them because there needs to be a bit of, uh, of flexibility. It decided that I, we, we're going to take this wholly self-judging approach, be consistent with that, and that gets you out of the issue you've raised there that these qualifications don't really match the world we're in today. The truly novel broadening of interdependencies, vulnerabilities, technology, media. And just to give you an example there, China has long ago decoupled from the U.S. media system, right? They haven't, they, they kicked Google out, um, Facebook, Twitter and all these because they couldn't control them well enough for their need for political security internally, but also as a national security issue. So... As you said, the domains where states now see risks and vulnerabilities are much broader. And so I think we're only in very early runnings in terms of all these new export controls. The U.S. is decoupling, obviously, the chip sector most prominently. And China does its own decoupling in stages and wants to be more self-sufficient and autarkic. We're only in the early phases. Countries are trying to figure out how do we extricate these biggest vulnerabilities, but yet continue trading because we, we've seen the data only a few... Uh, maybe a week or two ago that there was a record amount of, in terms of value, at least trade between the US and China in, in a lot of those other areas that are currently not conceived yet to be a major national security threat. So I think everyone's trying to struggle with this. They want the material benefits. Uh, outside of war, I don't think anyone wants to chop off trade. And, and I don't think it could between the US and China or EU and China, just like a, a, a legislatively. There, we're at the early runnings of this decoupling and how far it will go. I don't know. I don't think any of us can know that. But there's a lot, a long way to go yet, I think. Misha, just to be clear, when a country such as the United States imposes economic sanctions of some sort, be they export controls or sequestrate assets or, or what have you, of another WTO member, and, and let's face it, pretty much everyone in the world now is a member of the World Trade Organization, is it the Article 21 national security exception that is used to justify 
withdrawing most favoured nation status and, and national treatment, uh, the two sort of principles of, of, of WTO membership? Is, is it that national security exception that is used to, to make it legal? I think if somebody is going to challenge the US on a particular measure that is WTO inconsistent, then that's going to be the most obvious response that they can use to legally ward that off and say, look, we're still committed to the system, which they do often say as well. We, we just don't have the credibility that the system used to have that it can work at all the time in the ways we need it to work. So in recent uh, two recent USTR reports, it explicitly show, says we, res- we support the system, but are now willing to take actions outside the WTO where necessary. And I think then they can turn to that um, Article 21. Uh, Stuart, this brings us into the kind of legal contestability of these issues. Uh, for example, when they, when Trump wanted to put tariffs on steel and aluminium, there's two levels here. There's the domestic level and the international level. Internationally, Article 21. Domestically, he had to find the administration needed a way to do this because people were going to challenge him. Uh, firms were going to challenge this who want those cheaper imports, pro-liberalization, whatever. Different Different interest groups in the U.S. did challenge him. And so they had to pick the right domestic tool to be also able to do that. And so Section 232 of the Trade Expansion Act essentially is like an Article 21 in some ways. It authorizes the Secretary of Commerce to determine the effects on national security of imports and then gives the president almost a carte blanche power to react to that and assess whether those imports are in such quantities or in such circumstances as to threaten national security. So that was challenged legally in the U.S. and they were able to win those challenges. Nisha, one of the things that comes out loud and clear from the discussion about the national security exemption is that trust was an important element within WTO in ensuring that we managed to get from the 1940s through to the present day without litigating on this, uh, without clarifying it. And it's because... Everyone within the system kind of wanted the system to work. And people put a high price on the, the, the benefits of trade, the, the good that it did. Do, do you think that there is any trust left amongst the members of WTO or sufficient trust left amongst the members of WTO for uh, the system to hold together as it has done in the past? Or are we really looking here at the emasculation of the pre-existing global trading system? Yeah, I think de facto, we probably are looking at a form of disintegration. A large part of this is how the geopolitical tensions are interacting with a longer running economic tension, which brings it back to trust, Stuart. So China didn't liberalize in the way that the big other WTO members wanted it to. That didn't matter so much when China wasn't a direct competitor with them and they were gaining market access and all those benefits. They could turn a blind eye and still give the narrative that eventually it'll change. But now China competes and outcompetes in many ways uh, as a technological leader in a lot of sections. And that really raised the issue of their two very different economic systems interacting. And that China's system, as it is set up, gives a special strategic advantage through the role of the state in undermining foreign economic entities, private firms, closing access specifically when it wants to, subsidizing state-owned enterprises, giving various benefits, and just creating a completely unlevel playing field. And that's where the trust broke down. And I think that compounds and gets compounded by the geopolitical tensions which interact. And so I think the system now, because like China's second largest economy, biggest exporter of merchandise goods, uh, if you're not playing a game that you believe is fair with China and you're the US or even and the EU and Japan now, and, and they've all made very high profile statements about their dis, displeasure and unease at this systematic unfairness, then there's no more trust. And so how does the system move forward if the biggest players who are responsible for the vast majority of trade anyway, don't believe that they're playing the same game anymore? So I don't think the system is, go- I think it's going to limp along. The fact that the U.S. hasn't pulled out tells you countries won't pull out because you'd lose all those access benefits. But no one's no one's going to put the energy in anymore to drive it forward and progress the system. They're going to put the energy into new uh, plurilateral, bilateral arrangements that deal with these tensions, 
to agreements such as the comprehensive and progressive trade uh, partnership to have a high quality regional agreement that keeps China out or, and so forth. So I think all the energy in the system is not going into the WTO anymore. It's going into developments that will undermine the WTO, even if it doesn't die. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's limping. So, so you're right, obviously, that the large economies are the largest traders, but not relative to their own GDP. It's the the middle countries, the middle powers and the small countries that benefit the most from trade and, and need it the most because they simply aren't large enough to support uh, the plethora of industries uh, that a modern economy needs and that modern consumers wish to spend money in. So do you see a place for middle powers grouping together to create free trading blocks without superpower involvement? I probably wouldn't think not. I, I can see that middle powers, and I know, for example, here in Australia, there's a very strong commitment still to the WTO because smaller countries want that rules-based framework because they know one-on-one -on -one with bigger entities, they're always going to get pushed around. They want a multilateral system because it allows them to have a better voice grouped together in blocks, as you said. But even if we look at the CPTPP, um, so the US was leading that originally and obviously Trump pulled out and there's quite a number of middle powers in there, Japan, Canada, Australia. Uh, the UK is looking to join now in the, in the new version. But Japan led that after the US pulled out, but they all the time keep trying to get the US back in. They really want the US back in there. Because they know then they have the leverage and Australia really wants the US back in there. They know they have the leverage and backup of a really big, powerful country to rebut if China wants to join, for example, to, or to negotiate hard and hold China to account if they ever did allow them to get in because they say, OK, meet these standards, they can come in. So they need someone like that. Myself and a colleague in, in Adelaide, Peter Draper, we've made the argument in a policy brief that the EU now should try and get into should negotiate access to the CPTPP if it wants to have influence in the region, wants to have influence on any potential China accession talks, uh, and that these smaller agreements really can offer a way forward to have a new high, higher standards kind of trade agreement and have a very tight control over membership to make sure that anyone who's coming in is meeting those standards and are held accountable. Uh, that's very interesting, Nisha, because, of course, if the EU and the United States were to join, along with other countries who are currently in the accession process, you would have a, a huge percentage of the global economy uh, represented in CPD. It would almost be a WTO ex China, but with obviously a lot of smaller countries, very small countries excluded at the moment. But if, if they were to accede, those were, you would have effectively a replication of the world trading system, but just without China. Yeah, no, that's right. And that would be a very curious development historically. But I mean, you can foresee that uh, as a possibility. I don't, the, the US won't re-enter anytime soon. The domestic politics are so far away from that. So yeah, we'll see what happens on that one, short. But uh, the EU as well is a bit coy. They have a lot of agreements with, uh, bilateral agreements with those countries I think they're not seeing the bigger strategic geopolitical benefits and influence they would gain on trade in the region. Uh, but at the moment, they're kind of not really that. They're, they're, their interest is tepid at best, it seems. Nisha McDonough, thanks very much indeed for joining us. And we'll be back with the next episode of Current Accounts shortly. Thank you. Thank you.